Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I've been waiting months and months and months and months to have Joanna Weeb, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. Hey, Joanna. Hey. She is founder of Copy Hackers, which helps people write more persuasive, believable, and usable copy to boost website and email conversion rates, which everyone wants. She's written, you know, okay, and also I want to mention this, their copy hacker bundles have been consumed by over 14,000 startups and they've been featured on Kismetrics, Visual Website Optimizer, Copy Blogger, and many more. She's written crazy converting copy for some of the biggest names in online marketing like Neil Patel and been invited to speak at events like Inbound, Pro Blogger, among others. And even tech businesses like Shopify, Living Social, Unbounce, and Asana refer to her books and courses for copy guidance. And to top it all off, Mind Valley's Vishen Lakhani calls her one of the world's greatest copywriters alongside Frank Kern and the late, great Gene Schwartz. Joanna, thanks for joining me. Wow, I sound kind of awesome when you put you it like that. You do sound awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so what was he referring to when he called you one of the world's oh. greatest copywriters? Yeah, that was a nice surprise, right? Uh, Mind Valley is an organization that I respect and have had a chance to work a little bit with. Um, so that's been cool. But yeah, he was talking about this, um, this Facebook course thing he was pulling together to help small businesses and entrepreneurs, um, you know, find what they want to do and do it really well. Um, and yeah, so in that he was teaching a bit about copywriting and like encouraging people to write better copy. And that's when he referenced that he was going to take some of the principles he's learned from yours truly and Frank Kern and Gene Schwartz. Um, and that's when he called us all, you know, the world's greatest copywriters. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Right. And I always like to include a fun fact before we dig in deep, cause you have some amazing, uh, facts and figures with split testing and copywriting mm. fun facts about you. You have several, you've lived in Japan pan for a year you cannot yeah. swim that's true it's not even i can't even get close to water i'm so like petrified it's wow. awful does that stem from something or just i just didn't take lessons growing up and mm. then you get like this fear of what you don't know and how it could kill you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know i have like the nightmares of my recurring nightmare in my life right now is a giant tsunami wave coming and I'm sure that means a lot of things but it's it's very vivid this idea of being like drowned wow it's my awful, wife's right? a child psychologist I'm gonna have her watch the beginning of this and don't pick it me. apart no I'm really messed <laughs> up I know the, the other fun facts about you is you've published a young adult novel and you have two more under contract and you're the fourth of five children or the middle of seven if you include your stepbrothers and tell me about growing up as the fourth of five children Ah, uh, you're easily overlooked. In fact, my biological mother, with whom I'm not very close, but um, my bio mom didn't even know I could speak until I was having a conversation, like a little baby conversation, whatever, with my grandmother. And she was like, this girl can talk? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, because I was, you know, the fourth of five and you get it's you, you get kind of quieted down a bit. So I think the rest of my life has been a reaction to being quiet in the first part of my life. I got life. it. I got it. <laughs> so what was a big influence for you growing up? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, nothing like starting with the biggest question, right? Um, but yeah, a big influence for me, I think, when I look back at my 34 years, um, I think for me, a turning point in my life was when my dad returned to school. So my dad had been a truck driver all his life um, well, as we were children. Then he and my mother got a divorce and he took us, which was in the 80s, which is kind of rare for the father to get sole custody of five children. And so he took us um, and moved to a different province and just kind of started again. Mm. And went back to school, got his, you know, GED, I guess, and then went to university and became a French teacher. Mm. We're like, who is this man? Like, what are you doing? This is not the man that we saw as a child, as children, right? And so for me, that's been, I haven't, I think, stopped hearing that message in my life. Like everywhere I look, it seems that there's so many examples of 
people going out and doing something that they've wanted to do. People have maybe told them, like, surely my dad living in extremely lower middle class to just higher low class, or whatever we call it. Um, growing up kind of impoverished, you're surrounded by people who don't necessarily say, oh, do whatever you, whatever you want to do, you can do, right? They're, so he didn't get that message, but somehow he fought through that yeah. and went and did it anyway, even at an extremely low point. And so for me, that's like, well, shit, if it didn't hold him back right. and he had five kids, yeah, how did he no do it money, with five kids? It's crazy, right? Like you would be nuts to do that. Like you'd have to just be like, well, forget it. It's this or I just yeah. don't live a satisfying life or a life that I really want to live. And I think, you know, he believed in himself and I think he knew that he was going to be teaching us a lesson in this mm -hmm. too, right? Like watch your dad go through four years of, you thought you didn't have money before, wait till your dad goes back to school. Like now you have nothing, but you're going to see something really cool guys. And then, and we did, you know, we eventually did, but it was definitely hard um, during that period, you know, I was, I think in grade, um, six through nine is when he went back to school for me. So those are pretty formative years. And yeah. I definitely saw, you know, we were buying bread from the day old place and like eating, honestly, Twinkies, like that was the staple of our diet, which sounds like crazy. And I know that he mm. would be like, Joanna, it wasn't that bad. Right. Or something. But but that's like what sticks with me, right? Like it yeah. was, it was, it was hard. It's powerful. Um, but it really makes you, I think, a real fighter and yeah. an, an informed fighter, not just a random flying fighter, but yeah. someone who like maybe gets um, what it is to fight. Did you ever ask him years later how he did it or what motivated him to do that? Because doing that with one kid or no kids is hard for people to kind of. They're they've been in career forever and they go back to something else. Now you have five kids and you move to a different city. Did yeah. he ever express that? I didn't ask him and I wish I had. I can only imagine, right? He was like really at that point where you honestly have very little to lose, right? I, unless they take your kids away for it. Like that's the right. last thing you've got. Um, so that feels to me like, you know, there's nothing. Why not? Like yeah. forget it. Like why Just not? Go for it. You don't have a good job. You don't have anything you're necessarily proud of outside of your children. And so go try it right yeah. but i i don't i wish I, I wish you know he's your dad you don't talk to him until it's you know too late to talk to him right, right? so you saw him go through that so what were the early <laughs> days of your career like for me yeah oh they were like like living like a royal lifestyle compared to that but um for me uh my i started in um copywriting i dropped out of law school my dad actually died the first day mm. of oh um God. law school for me and i was like wow. holy crap like i don't want to be a lawyer my dad just died like it was kind of a thing for me too at that point right yeah. like we have those moments in our lives where yeah. you're like make a choice. What are you going to do? Um, and so I chose to drop out of law school and like floundered for like a month. But then I had a friend who was working at an agency and they were looking for a creative writer. And I was like, cool. I was an English major. I did creative writing classes there. I got some awards as a creative writer in undergrad, some scholarships. So I thought, well, let's try it, right? Work at an agency, put a few taglines together. Sounds kind of fun. Um, so I got that job, thankfully. And, um, it was very low paying. I think it was like 27,000 a year. Um, but I was happy just to be doing it right and doing something that wasn't law school. Um, so that's how I kind of got started. And, you know, you work, um, in an agency, you're doing everything and learning so many different things. Um, so it was exciting. <laughs> What'd you learn from the agency days that you still take oh. with you? Not to work for an agency. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot about, I think, relationships. But I'd really learned that. I think I'd learned that in Japan when because I'd been in Japan the year prior to that, um, year-ish prior to that. And it was all about getting friendly with people, right? That was the whole thing. You go there to teach English, but you end up just like socializing. And that's all people really wanted from me was like, oh, come sit with us and talk with us. And and so you learn a lot about, I did, I learned a lot about keeping a clean desk, which I still have today. I've actually got papers moved off to the side that are driving me a little crazy right now. But you keep a very clean desk and you are a friendly 
person who like invites relationship building. And I think that's taken me a long way. It, it was definitely something that got me the job at the agency. They actually mentioned that to me when they hired because I'd written thank you notes after every interview, which they were like, nobody else did that for one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, one of my notes was like written in this like, way that they really liked. So that's how they got hired, right? But this is like the beginning of, okay, you were willing to nurture this relationship. And that's, I think, one of the biggest things that I took away from working in an agency is you can have lots of great ideas, blah, blah, blah. But if people don't really get you and know you, um, you're just the one who came up with that random idea, which is kind of a commodity, right? It's just, they can get ideas anywhere. um, But if they know you and like you and trust you, you can do so much with that to grow your business. Yeah. And I remember reading on your bio page, Joanna, that you did not like the word copywriter early on, and you think this set you back three years. Easily. So why easily why did you not like the word, and how did it set you back three years? You know, I was talking with my boss, so I got hired, and they're like, okay, it's first day, and you're sitting there, and you do the thing where you know, you're getting onboarded, and they talk about the business card. Well, what are we going to make your title? And I was sitting there with Ted, my boss at the time, um, and he was like, so should we call you a writer or a copywriter or a creative writer? And we were both like, Mm-mm. he turned his nose up at copywriter. And so I kind of did too. Um, I didn't know what it was. It sounded really dry. Like it sounded like that is going to be boring. I do not <laughs> do that. So we called me a, co- a creative writer and, um, yeah, it's just to, it's to me when I look back on that, I just didn't know any better. Right. Who knows that? Like I fell into this world, just completely like stumbled into it. Um, So I didn't know that copy was essentially what I think now about copy. I had, I did not have anything resembling those thoughts when I first started. And so you develop this idea of yourself as like a creative um, collaborator. Mm -hmm. But now, like because I'm in the A-B testing world and conversion optimization, I would not lean towards creativity first and foremost. Um, so it's like, you know, you spent two and a half ish years there or whatever it was, and then moved on and got hired as a copywriter at Intuit, so a tech company. And I had to there be kind of trained out of the idea that we're going to come up with copy that sings, right? And, you know, clever taglines and all that kind of like a concept for an email campaign about buying QuickBooks in the spring. And we come up with like something to do with spring training. What does that even have to do with anything? You're not going to move any units if you're just like coming up with something creative, right? Right. Or at least we found that that wasn't, it didn't. So so that's what set me back is this focus on creativity. Mm -hmm. So what worked it into it when you were there? What worked? Yeah, that you that you wrote, you know, like you said, someone's like spring clean, like that's horrible. I'm not writing that. What what kind of stuff did you write it into it that you? I did write that. Oh, you did. Okay. Pitched that one. (laughs) (laughs) Now you don't like it. Now I don't like it. Now I would know much better than to do that. But it was a you know the creative department, Um, but things that worked there. It was when I started to get into a B testing and really that there were a lot of people, this was about, you know, seven or eight years ago. And a lot of people like conversion rate experts were starting to post a lot more meaty content about optimizing your copy in particular. So I was reading so much of these things that I hadn't really read before. Um, and doing a lot more with long form sales pages. And so I had this idea that um, we wanted to do this, um, As one really good example, there was this um, Intuit Merchant Services, which is what it was called at the time, Merchant Account, right? You want to sell things with, right? Merchant Account, everybody knows what that is. Um, There there was this great opportunity to get people to switch from another provider to Intuit's solution because the other provider had done something bad with their contracts and there was a lot of negative PR for them. So it was everybody who was using that solution was out of their contract instantly and allowed to go choose whatever they wanted to or stick with them. And we're like, hallelujah, right? Like, yeah, let's do something with that. So I was like, let's do a sales page, like an open letter. I think it was, I think it was an open letter to um, businesses who have blah, 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 um, have essentially done this thing um, or been affected by this negative. I can't remember the details of that. Um, but anyway, so I wrote this long form sales page. It was like so exciting because we're allowed to. We can quote people who are saying bad stuff about this other solution and really like do something with it. It was so meaty and amazing. Um, 
And we wrote it, we put it all together, we presented it to um, the CEO of the global business division. Um, and so, and he was like, that's fear mongering. You can't do that. And I was like, it's not fear mongering. Like it's not, it's saying, you know, you're in this bad position. We can help you into a good position, but he didn't want to do it. So, um, we snuck it out without his knowing. And, uh, we, the goal was, I don't know, we beat the forecast by like, it was a 1.5 or two X or right. Like it was, it was amazing. And there was an aggressive forecast as it was. And everybody was like high-fiving, but we couldn't tell <laughs> the CEO right. how we would got there. Um, so anyway, but that was like, that was one like cool win, right? That we had in a, in a tech company with this, right? Where there's Huge a lot company. of rules, yeah. right? Huge yeah. company. Huge company. Huge company. So with shareholders, um, less likely to necessarily take a lot of risks. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, but... The outcome was was really good. Unfortunately, I don't think that because we couldn't talk about it, the leader didn't know that. Oh, we should take that risk from this point right. on. So, oh well. At least I get. At least I have the benefit of knowing yes, that. Right? Your personal yeah. satisfaction. Yeah. So, who did you learn from at that time when you were getting started in what? When you discovered that you should be calling yourself a copywriter? No. Um, I really wish, like, I, I, kind of. People have good answers for this. I don't, because I am still like I only started reading, you know, Schwartz and Capels three and a half years ago, mm. and I've had a ten-year career in this, mm. um, eleven now I think. Um, and I just I didn't I didn't I was mostly observing yeah. what I mean other I think things... maybe there was there influential blogs that you were reading regularly or anything like that too I was reading a lot of the kind of copy that happens online today like um 37 signals would post a lot about how copy is part of their organization right like right. there is no copywriter everybody writes copy and right. tests it and does better and better with it that's like job one you have to be a good copywriter before you're anything yeah. else um, so reading that, reading, um, you know, early with conversion rate experts, as I mentioned before, I went and worked with them after that, but I started by reading their stuff and that was really eye opening. And then of course, you know, when you read those and people keep referencing things, Cialdini I'd been reading, I guess I'd read that early. Yeah. That was definitely one of the first books that switched me over to, um, like persuasion, mm -hmm. um, but so those were really the top ones. And then, you know, from there, there was a lot of now there's a world to discover, right? Now there's everything we've already talked, like shorts and all of that amazing stuff. And then more um, stuff like um, like Habit, right? And those types of books that are published today um, and that teach you things that are more about getting inside people's heads mm -hmm. and writing um, copy that will convince them in different ways than than what we've traditionally seen in advertising and marketing. So Jim, what I know you've mentioned big turning points for you in traction is when you've done A B testing. Tell me about some of the the uh, findings, some of your <laughs> your favorite findings. Because you get passionate about this stuff. I do. Yeah, I, like I really it. like it. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody should like it, although, you know, it's frustrating, but whatever that aside, the challenges of A-B testing aside, um, we did, we did this, this is on my blog too. Uh, Anyone who hasn't checked out copy hackers and the blog, your posts are absolutely phenomenal. They're so in depth and pictures, text. I mean, I'm like, whoa, this thing is so in depth. You just, it keeps going on and on. So I love it. So people need to I know, go check Some people that are out. like. Can yeah. you just shorten it down, please, Joanna? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah. So that's thank you for saying that. We do try with that. Um, but we've posted like about our Mad Mimi pricing page test. So mm -hmm. Mad Mimi is this email marketing solution. Very cool um, new platform that's kind of kind of competing with Mailchimp, I guess. Um, we did a pricing page test for them, and I love testing pricing pages and catalogs. I adore it. Um, so we did this test um, where we were switching things around, uh, just really like they had a four-column layout with their four SKUs or the four main plans, mm -hmm. and we took it down to three, and uh, like subordinating the um, the biggest one, the enterprise level one, which is like a five hundred dollar a month plan, or no, a thousand forty nine a month. Um, we subordinated that, and we were measuring. Um, micro conversion a lot of the time so just like a click 
um, just to see if we can get people to the next stage and then optimize that page, right? Mm -hmm. And do more there. So we're playing around with this. Mm -hmm. And in one of the variations where we moved that um, 1049 down and subordinated it and really just made it a text link, we got like a 2,000% lift wow. in clicks on that with on full the enterprise. on the enterprise one. Um, and of course, the reason that we feel that we got that click is because we didn't say what the price was. Um, and see. so it was a curiosity click, right? But if we had been able on the next page, if you know that, and you can get that many more people through, then of course an opportunity is on your next page to really position that price, right? Mm -hmm. Like take that opportunity to not just like most pricing pages will just have the price there and then you choose based on price, right? But if you, it, it said a lot to me about what you could do in the software world to make your prices more desirable and really um, take time to position that uh, everything that you're doing, right? And anchor that price mm -hmm. against other things if you dedicate a page to it. So we saw that, but we also saw we just saw crazy stuff going on and there was like insane lift like everything was like in the 200 300 percent range right like things were just going wild um in this test so i encourage people to check that one out because there were a lot of interesting learnings and then there's the flip side which i love which are the losing tests and i know my clients don't love losing tests but i learn so much mm. from them and there's so much we can take away so we had this one we were working with um Meta geek, and their audience is surprise, surprise, geeky people. So they had this. They were trying to increase opt-ins or like, uh, sorry, downloads for this their most popular free product. They get insane traffic. You know those businesses where you're like, you're that big. Like I don't even know who you are, and you're doing this like amazing business. Anyway, they're one of those businesses. They're insane. They were getting all of these downloads, but they just had text links on the page. And this was during what we call the summer of buttons, where we were really A-B testing to see what people click on and what they don't across a ton of sites. So we're like, okay, this is your most popular product. It's free. Why, like, all we have to do is turn this text link into a button and hello, like people can more easily acquire it. You can say things like, um, instant download under it and you know make it like a cool juicy button so ready to like just slam it on this like explode their conversion like they'll they'll be like sending us gifts and things or whatever so we tested it we tested i think four variations against the control which was the text links and they all every one of them that had they all had buttons and they all lost really? like lost embarrassing like where the clients like who are you? Like, what did you just Why do to do our business? Why do you think business? that happened? Well, so we posted about that, and we like to ask these questions of our readers too, right? Because we can make guesses, but better to kind of hear what people think about it, right? Yeah. And they were saying some interesting stuff about and this is, and I agree with what a lot of people said that um, they're dealing with people who are technical um, and highly savvy in the world of online and downloads and things like that. And a button that's really juicy looking can appear scammy or spammy. So it raised new flags or for, for that audience in particular, it raised flags. And I believe this to be true too, about what's going to happen on the other side. The anxiety of when I click this button, which looks like they're really trying to get me to click it, <laughs> is it going to be bad news? Right. So um, that's what that's what we take away from that. And that's I mean, there might be other things, you know, the copy could have been wrong on it. Right. There's lots of things that they mm -hmm. could keep testing, but I wouldn't encourage them yeah. to test for a buttons. technically savvy group. But the text link worked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They like text links. They go on forums that have a lot of text links. Right. And they trust those. As soon as you see a button. I don't know. They get their backs up a bit about it. Or that's what it seems to be. Yeah. But right. There's an interesting story there there's something you can actually like look at and go oh wow right like what the hell was going on there like how how did that even happen um and that's so those as much as i like you know great winners that are mm. obvious like a headline test that does you know really well mm. um it's those other weird ones that are so cool to yes. like unexpected experience. results yeah 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 so, and you also have a post about humble button humble button versus the powerful or um, the power of a headline. Yes. And that Which, was an interesting one too. 
Well, a lot of um, more traditional copywriters don't like it. I've heard bad things really? about it. Well, mostly because, and, and what I'm doing, so in it, I'm saying like, okay, we ran these tests, which we we did recently at the end of this summer, we conducted these um, 13 A-B tests on like different sites where we were asking, um, we were hypothesizing that if you use really attention grabbing kind of risky copy in your headline, you can increase conversion rates. Let's just try it, right? Yeah. Let's see. So we did, didn't pay, it didn't pan out that well. Um, it did kind of, it did for some. And it's always questionable, well, was your copy right, right? You can't just, there's still more testing to do. Um, but infinite testing. I mean, you could do infinite. infinite. Yeah. Isn't that unfortunate <laughs> that there's no end to it? But it's good because it keeps us in business. Um, so we, we conducted these tests where we were testing the headlines largely. And it's probably a limitation of the testing tools and what they're able to track and not track, right? So you don't know. You can easily track a click on a button. How can you, with a testing tool, really be sure that you're testing the quality? Like, how, how does someone show you that that headline is working for them, right. but maybe something else on the page still wasn't? People would say, oh, well, it's because it's controlled, so it's going to be, it can only be that headline that's affecting it. And that's true if you have, like, a ton of traffic, like a ton, like Amazon-style traffic. But when an element may not be directly tied to a click or a conversion, it might be good. Like the job of the headline, everybody says the job of the headline is to get you to read the next line, right? right? right. So to expect to get a click out of it is asking like, a lot. Mo yeah, multiple steps between the headline and giving a click. Totally. Yeah. So I'm looking at, so these we're testing all these headlines. And the lifts are good, but they're modest right and they're barely reaching significance so we don't feel good about them at all hmm. um some of them did reach full confidence but it was again with like a really modest lift um so i'm looking at these headlines on these pages and i'm looking at these awful buttons that are on the page like the thing that you have to convert on is right there hmm. and it's not very good so we then went and tested optimized buttons with optimized headlines and without optimized headlines and repeatedly, of course, we saw a huge lift um, again and again, like mega lift, like mm -hmm. for Drasippy.com, um, which is this cool UK girls like try on clothes virtually, no matter the size of your body, the shape of your body and things like yeah. that. Um, so it's this cool little service that they just want to get people into. Like it'll be, you'll use it. It, it demonstrates and then it sells, right? That's like yeah. demonstration is like sells most things, but it really sells that too. Um, so get into it and get started. So we tested a headline that used the language that prospects, people who were using Drasippy, were using to describe their body. So yeah. kind of natural language. It was risky. It right? was he risky. Said, I read it and I was like, ugh, like is someone going to be offended or are they going to love it? It's like it can go either way. Yeah. So we were testing against like clothes you'll love, perfect for your shape and size. That was the control, I think. And then our headline was, uh, I think... Big bum, thick waist, not so perky boobs, fine clothes you'll love or something like that. Yeah. Um, but like it was meant to grab your attention and speak to a specific audience yeah. um, using words that they use. And so I'm looking at this going, this is this is a pretty good headline for like the tech world, right? Like it might not be a direct response headline at all, but for this, this world, this website, this yeah. homepage, yeah. it should be doing something. We had a, I think it was a 14% lift with 98% confidence or something like that, um, that we finally got to. And that was, that took a while to get there for the headline. When we tested the button copy changed with the headline changed, we saw 123.9% full confidence, 100% confidence This ran for, it's still running and still at full confidence yeah. um, um, for this new headline that instead of saying sign up now, it said, uh, find outfits you'll love or shop or show me outfits I'll love. Um, so we saw this enormous lift when we did the headline and button together. So I wrote a post. I was like, okay, world, what's up with that? Like, how can it be that this headline, that headlines, which I'm a copywriter, I believe in the power of headlines. Right. I'd be like, who would I even be if I didn't? But how can it be that we saw such a poor result compared to when we optimize the headline plus button. So all I was saying was, 
if we're gonna be testing online and we're gonna try to jump to conclusions after having done a test, right? Or we're gonna try to reach a conclusion, hopefully not jumping there, but get there statistically uh, where it's valid, um, then we can't ignore the button. And so I wrote this post about that, like mm -hmm. headlines are great, but if you're testing online, you better be sure that you're optimizing your button while mm -hmm. you're at it. And people responded well to it, but some people, there's the most recent comment on there I think is, um, is a, a gentleman who's a copywriter who's worked for Ogilvy and all that kind of stuff. Great, cool stuff. And he is adamant that we are wrong, 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 wrong. So whatever. But it fun. gets people thinking because they just go to the default, which is click here or sign up or download. Yeah. And they really need to just not just blow that off and think about what's on that button. Yeah, because if... I mean, what's problematic is that that headline was good. And what I took away when we did the headline and button test together is that the button, when it was optimized, allowed the headline to prove its worth, right? Because people found the button easy to click and they wanted to click it perhaps more because of that headline. Now, people could be saying, oh, you're just trying to like, Re yeah, like validate your belief that headlines yeah. are great or something. But if you don't optimize your button to, and you're measuring based on clicks, even though your headline isn't going to 100% drive the clicks, mm -hmm. um, just be careful, right? You have to optimize that button. Yeah. So yeah. Joanna, I love that post, by the way, and people have to check that out. Now, right. what are some of the most successful campaigns that you've run and why they were so effective? You know, campaigns where we optimize the whole funnel. Are usually the best and that takes a lot of work and investment of course yeah. um, but when you go from um, getting better leads into your onto your list getting yeah. better subscribers on that list and then optimizing your drip campaign optimizing the sales emails and optimizing those sales landing pages those are the ones I mean for me businesses that only focus on and I work in the tech startup world right like I work with that's largely my thing um, and so these are people who often think that they're running a web business and that's it, right? Like come optimize our homepage or optimize our pricing table. Um, and then you talk to them and realize that no, 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 there is a huge email business to be done here, right? Anybody who is a SaaS business, a software as a service business is doing its best to get trial users, right? Yeah. Get lots of people in to try it and then letting them try it. What do you mean let them try it? They don't know what they're doing yet. They don't have any idea, right? So um, so that's where email, of course, based on what they click on, what they do or don't do, where they are, email is huge for most businesses that think of themselves as web businesses. In fact, they're email businesses that let people convert on the web. Yeah. Um, and so most of, most of the work that I'm doing right now is in email because it's so exciting and there's so much you can do to really grow a, a business fully. Um, so that's, that's, those are the most successful ones that I have. I mean, um, mm -hmm. what have we, you, you have a book, you have a book that people can get on an email, don't you? No, we're actually working on a course right now oh, that course. should be out. We're going to launch it on AppSumo hopefully in November. Cool. Um, so yeah, that'll be easy to get because it's AppSumo, so they'll grind us. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, because they're awesome. We love the people at AppSumo. We have a great relationship with them. Um, but yeah, that'll be coming out, but it is a, it's something that we haven't really um, spent a lot of time teaching. But more recently, when we're seeing a lot of great um, results from some tests we're running in email, now we have something to teach based on, right? I, that's, I think that's one of the things that makes the Copy Hackers products um, uh, higher quality or people feel really good about them um, is because they're based largely, they've got so many case studies in there where it's not just like, Joanna says, right. you should do this no, with the headline. You're, it's like, Joanna says this plus Your writings are fantastic plus. with case studies and specific examples and showing people um, more than a lot of the ones I've seen. What have you found, Joanna, that's worked one thing that people should think about when they're trying to convert a free trial user to a paid uh, paid user. Um, I know one it's like the, a heavy question. You know, there's yeah, a lot no, of it's factors. A good one, but... though. I hope that my answer doesn't suck um, because this is what I am. I'm saying it a lot more recently, and people seem to be connecting with it. Like it seems to resonate a bit, and that is 
not to ask anything to do more than one job, that one job that is most obvious for it. So what the hell does that mean, right? Okay, so that means like if you want to get people to click your button, that's the job of the button to get people to click it, right? That's all that button is allowed to be asked to do. If it does more, great, that's its job. Um, headline has one job too, right? On a lot of pages, you can't expect a headline to sell, period, right? Unless it's on your cart and it's the headline in your cart, then it might be closely connected to that. Um, but this idea of everything having one job, your subject line has one job, your body copy and your email has one job, the call to action there has one job. And if you ask it to do more than that, it's going to fail. If you narrow it down and people disagree with me on this all the time. I'm like, okay, you've tried it your way and it doesn't work. Trying to get your subject line to summarize what's inside your email isn't working. Having your subject line SaaS business, you're trying to convert people from trial to paid user and you welcome them with a welcome email that says welcome to flow or whatever your product is and nobody opens it shocker because that's like that subject line isn't actually doing the job of getting of that one job of getting people to open mm -hmm. now obviously the caveat is don't do it in a scammy way so you could say jennifer lawrence naked photos inside and some people might open that that's a bad way to get those opens, right? It's a bad subject line. It's doing its job but very poorly um, in the wrong way. And so if you were to do something that gets people to, um, um, that has that one job. So we did this for Metalab, uh, which is this very cool agency based in Victoria. They have a lot of SaaS products. One of them is Flow. Um, Flow is a project management solution. So we tested Welcome to Flow against Get Started with Flow against, um, and this was the one that we worked on. Um, oh, can I ask you something? Question mark. Which one do you think got the most opens? I'm gonna can I ask you something? Right? Yeah. right? Yes. Of course. Welcome to flow. Ma. Do I really want to open that? That's not doing the job of trying to get me to open it. Um, get started with flow, but that's not what I'm actually going to do. I'll get started with flow five steps from now when I actually end up back on your website. So it's not doing the job of getting me to open it necessarily. But can I ask you something did? And we saw 50% more opens, 45% more opens on that one. That's huge, yeah. Um, yeah. And so if you're a, a SaaS business or you're someone who's trying to convert trial to paid, you will be using email marketing. If they're not opening those emails, and if they don't get in the habit of opening those emails, you are not going to convert them into a paid user, except in the rarest of cases and that's where people are like this is exactly the solution I need I need it right now I'll pay you whatever right and if only we had those people like knocking at the door right that's so rare right so um yeah so focusing on that kind of stuff when you're working in your email marketing I think is critical to moving more people from trial to um, yeah. to eventually yeah. pay of course having a great product goes a long way yeah I could probably spend the next hour asking you free to paid uh, how do you how you convert more free to paid? But I'm gonna hold back for a second because I have so much more to ask you. But um, also, I want to ask you, Joanna, is what do you advise startups and businesses? You work with a lot of startups, a lot of businesses. What do you advise them against that sometimes they don't want to listen to you? Uh, I advise them largely against um, lorem ipsum, which shouldn't surprise any copywriter. Uh, if I, <laughs> I advise them against um, letting design lead copy. So design shouldn't lead copy, I believe, and I've found that copy should lead design. And I think most copywriters would agree with me. A lot of designers would not agree with me, um, but conversion-focused designers are more likely to, right? And this kind of stems back to that initial, like, 37 Signals, now called Basecamp, of course. Um, they've done so much work in the tech world for elevating the role of copy, the need for great copy and for letting copy lead design. Um, so they've done a lot of heavy lifting there to get the world on board with that idea. Um, and so that's helped, but it hasn't made it like, oh, okay, everybody who reaches out to you is willing to let copy lead design. Um, it takes a lot more work, but that's, that's, that's one of the biggest things because if, if you try to cram your message into something some designer put together, like what? It's, it seems so like, so kind of archaic almost. Like, 
like you don't you can't just shove your important sales message into whatever space the designer thought would be enough space for a message that he or she wasn't even thinking of yet. But it's very it's very hard to convince people, largely I think because um, the design world has done such a good job talking about how important design is. And we are maybe not doing as good of a job yet talking about design and copy working together online and in email. Um, the need to do both and to consider both and to let copy lead design um, as like the the side note that we eventually get to. Um, but that's one of the biggest um, the biggest thing. Another one is of course getting people to use email hmm. to sell. Yeah, you yeah. have a strong opinion on this. So I do. I I do. I've seen so many these tentative, sad little attempts. <laughs> if you're going to email somebody, you're going to interrupt them. You have a solution. They've opted in to hear from you. I'm sure every copywriter listening is like, obviously, but so many businesses are not like, obviously, but you have a solution. They have indicated an interest in that solution. Yeah. Connect them, right? Like, what are, you, what are you doing? You have this great solution here. You have a person who why do you wants think they're held like back it. why do you think uh they're holding back um because um selling is ugly and it's the devil's work right like i did a talk at microcomp which is for micropreneurs in the tech world yeah and it was called I how to sell with rob yeah with rob oh Long, yeah right yeah. Yeah. yeah rob's awesome right yes um and he is willing to sell so there are some that are but this how to sell without selling your soul um right this huge fear that um, if you have to work to sell your product and read Hacker News, right, where all the developers and tech startups hang out, or at least have hung out, I don't know if they're all there necessarily right now with growth, growth hackers and things like that. Um, but if you go through Hacker News and look at what a lot of like uh, technical co-founders say about in response to attempts to sell, they're all like, yeah. essentially, they go back to um, Apple doesn't need to sell. <laughs> and you can't really have a conversation with that because you're like. Uh, that, uh, so many obvious things. You're not Apple, so there's that. And there was a time when Apple needed to sell. And if you think that what they're doing now isn't selling, you crazy. Like you're not looking at all. <laughs> but people get, um, they think that they shouldn't have to. If their product is good, it should sell itself. How did which you get is, in the tech world? How did I get yeah, it? Yeah, how did you land in the tech space? Into it helped a lot, gotcha. right? Because um, you're working at selling software. Yeah. Um, but we've also, you know, we've built little hobby startup things, right? So you hang out on Hacker News and learn, right? And, and you communicate with and connect with other people who are building little tools and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and so it just kind of yeah. fell out of that. Yeah. And we just love people who are building their own tool or who are actually getting traction with that tool. And, and now others tool. are using You have a tool, that? right, that you've come out with? We, we do. It's in beta. It's called a Try Disco. It's an incentivized survey. So, you know, you get a pop up on a website that says, hey, you know, you ask your visitor a question and then you like say thank you and vanish. And they're like, thanks for interrupting me in the middle of trying to use your website. Um, and so we're like, well, and because we use surveys so much at Copy Hackers and Lance, my partner at Copy Hackers and in life, um, he is in conversion rate optimization. He uses surveys all the time. That's where you're going to find a lot of your best messages, I find. Um, so if we're recommending people interrupt visitors to their site and try to get good information from them, um, what's that? What might that be doing um, for their conversion rate? And is there not a better way, you know, in a more of a thanking economy? Um, to thank them for that and to reward them for that. So that's what this goes about. You can, you know, answer this question and we'll give you 8% off your purchase. Done, so what's right? some of the interesting data you found from people using surveys? Are you using the Try Disco? Like for Disco itself, yeah. like as a product? Like on or a website. Like yeah, like you actually, yeah, it was implemented on a website or your website. What was some interesting data that you discovered from users? We, well, yeah, I mean, what we found, a lot of things, right, but um, we get a really high response rate and we get people 
answering five questions in a row, right? Wow. Because they're watching their incentive go up um, and they're not sure what it's going to go up by. Um, and there's also research that says, you know, gamified um, and incented surveys um, are more likely to have more accurate data. So fewer things that are just, just they just want to click an answer in order to like close the thing down or something when they see that incentive, um, that can go a long way. So, so we're seeing them complete five questions in a row, which is kind of amazing, right? With drop off being very minor. Although when your um, incentive doesn't go up as much on like, so if you're on question three and you've seen your incentive go from save 8% to, okay, I answer one more question and save 11%. Okay, do you have time for one more? Save 12%. If it's small on that one, instead of being save 15%, the drop off is high mm. um, there. But we've also strangely seen that people will complete this survey and then write to us later and say like, I didn't even want to buy anything from you, <laughs> but I liked the survey so much and I kept doing it and I ended up with 25% off, so I did. So we were like, okay, this is not just a great, potentially a great tool for conversion rate um, experts who are trying to learn about their visitors, but also for conversion rate experts who want to increase conversion using incentives. Um, so that's some of what we've found for Disco, the product, if that's what you meant. Yeah, yeah. So what kind of questions, because I'm sure you went through a lot of questions before you put them on there. What was a question you came up with that is especially powerful that people should be using to ask their their users? Um, one of the... <sighs> I guess some of the easier ones, now it, it depends at what point you're in um, in the survey to get the best responses, but um, one of the things that I found most useful is trying to get down to their awareness level with a question, right? So figuring out um, how much they really know about you, and you can do that by asking these you know, five questions in a row. If you're looking at the five stages or states of awareness, um, then you can actually ask those five questions to get them there. Messaging, wording it in the right way so they're not like, hey, what stage of awareness do you think you're in? Right? All these things are like, go away. Um, but saying more like, um, if you have, if you believe that people are product aware, you think that people coming to this page are aware of your product um, versus like solution aware or just pain aware, um, then asking a question about like, have you, had you heard of our brand before today? and then getting a simple yes or no there, right? And you can start to say, okay, people landing on this landing page or people landing in our cart, which Disco is one of the few tools that I would recommend you put in your cart because who wants to interrupt someone in their cart, but you're getting an incentive. So, um, but if you learn those things, then you can do a lot more with understanding if you need long copy with understanding uh, where people, how people are getting to a point where they're ready to purchase from you. If they weren't aware of your brand today and they're in your cart buying, um, that says some interesting stuff too about how your site's performing or what your messages are saying and then you can figure out new questions to ask. So there's there's those kinds of questions I find are very valuable. Um, if you're ready to use the data to go optimize the page on which you asked that question. Mm -hmm. You just want to ask random stuff for God knows why and I can't really help you. I don't, right? There's ask anything then. Ask what their birthday is. Who knows, right? Um, but But that's, I think that's been perhaps one of the most valuable ones. Yeah. So Joanna, there was another question I want to ask is some of your favorite headlines. Mm. Yes. What are some of your favorite headlines? What are they? Yeah. Um, the ones that like that, that we've done? The one that you've done or that you've seen. Okay. Um, okay, so we had for Beachway, which is a rehab center in Florida. Very competitive. Anybody who's worked with uh, treatment centers of any kind knows just how competitive they are. The AdWords are very expensive, um, highly competitive, and we're talking like $60 for a click. Um, yeah. And there's a lot on the line, right? An empty bed is $20,000 at least lost that month from that one bed. So important to fill up your rehab center. So we were working with Beachway um, and we were trying to optimize their homepage which is great and great fun to do. And I was, so I went and I did what I normally do. And that's like, I, I'm not in the rehab space, so I don't know what people are looking for there. I can make assumptions, but 
good Lord, that's like a nightmare. Who would want to make assumptions and then write copy without learning, right? Right. So I went and looked at what other uh, rehabs were saying on their websites. And they were all saying basically nothing in like, like no one can commit, no one can make a claim, no one can really say anything. And then they're saying it in this like really clinical, but like floral way where you're like, what am I getting here though? Like I'm an addict or I am the loved one of an addict. I am in a heightened emotional state likely, or something bad has happened recently to get me here. And you're going to talk to me in this, BS way, right? Like I encourage anybody like watching to go and Google like rehab center and just click on what comes up. They're so, you know, trying to be calming and peaceful and stuff. And I was like, I don't know if that's a tone that would necessarily resonate with people who are landing on your homepage and like trying to get the phone number to call you to get their loved one into a bed like tomorrow. Like how do we get them there? Do you have, do you accept my insurance plan? That's like what they want to know. Right. Um, so I went, I looked at those sites, didn't, uh, didn't agree with the tone they were using. And, but in the absence of being able to speak with actual clients of Beachway, which would be great for getting a sense for tone. But again, it's so emotionally charged, everything about it. And you go in one way, you feel one way while you're in there. And hopefully you come out a different way. When you come out, do you have real recollections of what motivated you to get in or you've changed so much that to me, it didn't feel like interviewing people, especially given the the scabs you'd be pulling off that are really quite raw still. Yeah. Um, is it worth it? So I went to Amazon, um, Amazon and Google and on there searched for uh, books on dealing with loved ones who are addicts, dealing with, um, with being an addict, trying to overcome alcoholism, uh, trying to overcome a drug addiction. And I looked through the reviews on those books, which is something that I recommend. And I've heard other people recommend it too. It's a really, really great strategy for finding the way your prospect talks and what they're talking about. And I looked through to try to get a sense for their expectations uh, when it comes to resolving a problem of addiction. And I mined all these reviews looking through for interesting language. And there was a lot of interesting language there and a lot of you know things that came up that I could use for a messaging hierarchy. But one line that... A gentleman wrote in his review of a book was, if you think you need rehab, you do. And it stuck with me. Powerful, yeah. Right? It feels powerful. And so I put it in there. It was just one of many kind of sticky messages that I put in this document where I captured all of this stuff. And then when I put it aside, went back to it, and that line kept sticking with me. So I was Mm. like, okay, let's test it. Let's see if there's something to it. So we put it as a homepage headline and we tested it. We also tested a testimonial, um, which is interesting and a data point about, uh, you know, um, success rates. And this, if you think you need rehab, you do blew the other ones out of the water. And like, nobody expected this, right? The guys that I was working with, the actual consultants that I was working with at Beachway, they were like taking bets on which one was going to lose. And this one was supposed to lose. Like, they're like, why do we even test this stuff? And I'm like, just test it. Let's just test it. So we did 26% more leads. And those leads were completed on the next page, right? So it wasn't even on that homepage. But that headline was powerful enough. And I think a headline only has one job to do, and it's not to complete leads on the next page. But those leads were directly tied to this one change that was made here. This, if you think you need rehab, you do. We were saying it so differently from the way other people were saying things. And I think using the right language and that that brought in big results, right? Yeah. That, so that's one of my favorites that's for huge. sure. Yeah, and the strategies yeah. behind that are very valuable. So, so thanks for sharing that. So you should put in now, if you think you need try disco, you do? Or would that work? <laughs> yeah, I'll give that a shot. <laughs> so I know we're running out of time. Joan, I wanted to get two more questions in, you know, because it's Inspired Insider. And I mean, there's so much I wanted to ask you, but um, uh, we have limited time. So I wanted to ask you a low point hmm. and how you push through that low point. Ah. <sighs> And I promise um, I'll end with something upper, but I want to get, you know, get that, um, what motivates you and how you push through the low point. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've definitely, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of things, right. But I think that, you know, we talked about my dad early on and, um, 
uh, emotions, <laughs> emotions raging. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but he, when he died, he died of, um, brain cancer of brain. He had a brain tumor, huh. um, at 51 and he'd been a teacher for like eight years or something. He'd gone back to school and he'd had like this brief period of time, but you know, in the scheme of things, it's a brief, very, very brief period of time. Yeah. It seems, um, for what he should have, what, you know, you feel he should have had, right? Like he did all this work. He like raised five kids on his own, essentially, yeah. uh, doesn't the man deserve more. So that was like a low point for me, but it was one of those, you know, major points, right? Like a shift, right? It made me change everything. It made me feel different about myself and what I wanted, um, what we should do. And, you know, everybody has that when someone close to them dies, but this idea of having such limited time yeah. and wanting to do something good with it. Um, and, and that that can change at every point too. Right. But that was, that was low. And I think that's a, probably a interesting place or a good place to start a different sort of life. So that was a, that was a low point. Um, but getting past it, you know, it's helped to put things in perspective, right? A lot of things in perspective. And, yeah. um, and there's this, um, there's a sketch. I'm sure you've seen it. Everybody has seen it. Um, but it, it hits me for some reason. Um, I get these, you know, for what pushes me to move forward and get past lows, um, is this idea that you're like this far away from that breakthrough that you're looking for. Right. And I feel that I've had a lot of breakthroughs, thankfully at copy hackers, um, the startup community, if you're like, not sure what world to work with, work with startups because they're so, um, the whole community is so it, it's accepting. It allows everybody in as long as you can just like do it. It's like very receptive to you, like joining the team. Um, but you know, I, there's a sketch, um, that is this, these two miners. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm, these yeah. two miners, right? And there's one guy, he turns away and he's got his pickaxe over his thing. And he's been tunneling and now he's done because he didn't get there. And the guy below him is still tunneling away. And you can see on both of them, they've both got this, like the jewels just right. on the other the side. Inches from the jewels, yes. Exactly, yeah. right? So you're like, just keep just keep kind of going and it's so cheesy. Some things will stick with people, right? Mm. And that's just happens to be something that sticks with me. So that's kind of an image I keep in mind when I have to, you know, push through and it's like, oh, is it, is it, you know, all of those things, right? Is it worth it? Is, you know, is this really, if I were to die tomorrow, is this the thing I'd want to die doing, right? Those yeah. lower points, yeah. which what can you really say yes to, right? Those kind of like, bathing in cheesecake or something like yeah okay i could die doing that i don't know that's gonna be the title of this interview is bathing with cheesecake no um last question what's been one of your proudest accomplishments uh yeah um one of the coolest things for me it makes me the proudest um mm. you know when people that you really admire reach out to you right and i've been thankful to to get that um grateful to get that and blessed with that i had actually um so i was working out into it right and you feel like you're just like part of like you're a cog right you're doing stuff nobody gives a damn about copywriting you know you kind of hate everything <laughs> and you go out on your own and as you're doing that you're reading all these people like darren rose at pro blogger and you know brian clark at copy blogger things like that and everybody else, right, in the whole, in the, all of this copywriting space that you're, like, reading, right? Um, I was going to say something else, and I decided not to. Um, and so I was about a year and a half into Copy Hackers, and I had written this guest post on Kiss Metrics about um, pricing, how to make your, your product look like a total steal. Um, I think it was called a total steal or something like that in the URL. Um and so it was this like epic post, right? Nine ways. You only write this. epic posts. Right? Yeah. You got it, right? Um, and so I posted it, blah, blah, blah. It's great. And then um, a couple weeks, weeks later, I get this email in my inbox and it's from Brian Clark. And I'm like, okay, I guess it's just, you know, it's, but it's not in my promotions tab. It's over in my like main part of Gmail, like, the, like where a direct message comes to you. Um, and he was saying how much he loved the post and do I want to speak at his copy blogger authority intensive? Wow. And I was like, 
what is Brian Clark doing reaching out to me? This is amazing, right? This is so cool. So that was like, you know, and then, and since then we've actually developed a, a nice little relationship, which is like even more stunning to me, right? Like I'm always like, like who, what, how did this even happen? And then I got to meet Darren Rouse through him and then Darren invited me to do some stuff with him. So, you know, this, these, these moments, um, that I'm very proud of that I wouldn't have expected to have happened when I was like adding to it and trying to get people to like change copy and worry about copy and think about copy and feeling like nobody was listening. And so that's definitely been one of my proudest accomplishments. So Joanna, thank you so much. I just want you to take a second, tell people where they can find out more, anything that you're working on lately that they should check out. Sure. Um, they can find me at um, on Twitter at Copy Hackers. That's what I am with an S. The poor at Copy Hacker guy is always like, "It's not me you want, it's her." Um, and so it's at Copy Hackers, um, and then online copyhackers.com. Um, you can send me emails through the contact form, and it'll go really great to me, right? So um, that's where that's where I'm really at um, Twitter and on my yeah. on my website. Fantastic. There's a Joanna. blog you should read too. It's definitely, definitely a blog you should read. Joanna, I want to be the first one to thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you. It's been great. It was yeah. really nice talking to you. Thanks you so too. much. Thank you, Joanna.